Good morning. My name is Jerry Murdoch, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees here at the Aspen Institute. And I'm also the co-founder of Insight Venture Partners. And um, I've spent my entire career looking for game-changing, innovative ideas. And while I don't have any involvement in this project, that's, um, uh, I am a big admirer of the potential of this project and what it has and what its impact could be on all of us and on the future generations after us. Um, I want to announce today's um, and introduce today's speaker, um, Stephen Attenborough, the commercial director from Virgin Galactic. But before I introduce him, let's just take a moment and get a, get a little look, a little view into what this project's all about. So we'll roll the video now. Thanks, Jerry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Jerry in particular for his fantastic support, uh, not just during this week, um, but over the last couple of years for everything we're doing at Galactic. Uh, we've had a ball the last couple of days. It's been a fantastic festival, uh, and uh, nice to see some, some friendly faces in the, front seat, in the front rows there. Managed to get out of belly up and here this morning, which is some achievement. Uh, and uh, I also noticed somebody that looks uncannily like my boss sitting in the back row, but hopefully he's not here. Um, so, uh, let me just start with a show of hands. Um, who, at some point in their life, dreamt about going to space? Fantastic. Who thinks they will go to space? And who, if price wasn't an option and you knew you would come back safely, would go to space? <laughs> That's pretty much everybody, which is fantastic. You know, this is one of the most remarkable projects that's going on in the world today. Um, and uh, I really like this picture, and I often start showing it to show it when I start uh, talking about Galactic, because it sort of looks pretty ordinary. But actually, it's probably one of the most phenomenal pictures you will ever see, um, because it, it shows three things which have never existed before. The first thing, uh, right on the left there, is the corner of Spaceport America, just down the road from here, I guess, uh, in the, uh, the southern part of New Mexico. It's the world's first purpose-built commercial spaceport. Uh, it was designed by Foster and Partners. It is a fantastic, a beautiful building out there in the desert. It's where our future astronauts will train. It's where they'll fly to space from. And it's there. It's real. You can go and visit it if you like. The second thing, of course, uh, is that uh, whatever it is in the background, that vehicle uh, in the background, which I'll talk more about in a moment, uh, which, of course, is Virgin's brand new, beautiful spaceship. It's the world's first commercial manned spaceship, uh, and it is very real. And the third thing, and perhaps this is the most important thing, is this group of people in front of the, uh, the spaceship there uh, are Virgin Galactic's future astronauts, or some of them at least. Uh, we'll talk more about our future astronauts in a little while, but uh, this is a community 
a group of people who stepped up to the plate early. They come from 52 countries around the world. There are 640 of them. In fact, I think there are 642 because Richard signed up two over breakfast this morning. Uh, and uh, they um, are so important to this, to this project. But we'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. Um, and I've left my slide thing just down there. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so this is a very, very real project. You know, I think a lot of people will have heard of Virgin Galactic, but it's often will be a surprise at just how advanced we are. Um, these vehicles are real. They're flying. Uh, we fully expect the spaceship to be right in space during 2013 and for our first commercial passengers to start flying in 2014. So we are very, very close. But let me just take a step back a little bit because um, you might ask, you know, why would anybody want to do that? And it's a good question because getting to space isn't easy. Getting to space with normal people on board, keeping them safe, giving them a great experience, hopefully making some money out of it is very, very hard. And as I've been at this uh, company, I've been here for about eight and a half years now, I think it's defined for me more than anything else as that it's just so important to get right first time, but it's really hard to get right first time. And I think that only Virgin in some ways, you know, are capable of doing this because Virgin just has a history of loving a challenge. It's almost what Virgin exists for. And, you know, we have built one of the most incredibly diverse brands in the world by targeting industries that have become lazy or complacent or who are serving their customers badly. And we move into their space, we shake them up, and we force change. And uh, that really has been, been Virgin's history. You know, we did it with airlines, we've done it in the music business, done it really across a whole range of sectors. Uh, the airline industry is probably the one that people know best. Uh, we were at a panel session here on um, uh, Sunday afternoon, I think, when uh, four incredible people were being asked about uh, their various views on design. And they were asked about which brands you know, they, they really ad admired out there. And one, I think without prompting, said Virgin America. And that's a great example of how uh, you know, Virgin has been able to come in and just improve dramatically the customer experience by great design and a real understanding of what the customer experience should be. And if you look back, of course, in Virgin with Airlines, it started back in 1984 with uh, Virgin Atlantic um, at the time. It's slightly strange talking about this with Richard in the room, but Richard uh, was flying across the uh, Atlantic on a regular basis, hating the experience, and decided he could probably do it better. Uh, and uh, so managed to get hold of a 747, launched Virgin Atlantic, uh, and I guess the rest is history. And at the time, it was very interesting because Marketing Week in the UK uh, did a survey, and they said, this is a very strange way for a brand to evolve. You know? And we sort of doubt that you can go from a record business to an airline and take your customer base with you. And they said, in fact, we're, we're going to do a survey. And so they went out to their readership and said, how many people would be willing to fly the Atlantic from London to New York on, on an aircraft with a record label, basically, on the tail? And uh, the next week, they came back and said, yep, just as we thought. 90% uh, uh, of those that responded said they wouldn't want to fly across the Atlantic on an aircraft with a record label on its tail. Uh, so Richard then wrote a letter, which was published in the following week, saying thank you so much for doing the research, which I probably should have done before I started the airline. Uh, however, you know, if 10% of the British public are willing to fly, then I better buy some new aircraft. And, uh, and of course, uh, as I say, the rest is history. And that, 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 like so many other Virgin businesses, started with a huge challenge, you know, a belief that we could do it better, uh, and, uh, and innovated, um, just provided great design, great customer experience. Uh, and you know, created some of the most you know, fantastic com com companies in the world. We tend to uh, announce early. We tend to, to, to tell the story, warts and all. We're not always successful. Uh, uh, you know, there are one or two virgin companies which haven't quite made it, and I'm going to steal a Richard joke here, but um, one of those was one that I don't think made it to Aspen, but uh, it certainly made it to London. It was called Virgin Brides. Uh, and uh, this was a great idea for a business. Uh, it didn't work too well, and as Richard said, the trouble is we just couldn't find any customers. <laughs> uh, so moving on, um, you know, we talk about our dreams, and as well as our shorter-term ambitions, we try to have fun in what we do, and try to live our lives as well, remembering that while there is always the possibility that there may be no tomorrow for us individually, there will be for the businesses and the, the customers and the people that they serve. And one of the things that we have been uh, doing in the past few years is really to understand how we can use the brand to inspire and promote uh, the pace of change that is required in order to keep our businesses successful, but also 
to, to make the businesses that we run sustainable in the world with as many challenges that it faces today. And we sort of sum that up that, uh, you know, we don't just play the game, but we aim to change it for good. Um, and I think that better than anything really sums up the Virgin philosophy. So let's sort of move into the air before we move into space and sort of give an example, I guess, of how we, uh, how we tend to, to use the, the brand to inspire um, the companies which are going to be very important to us in the future. And, uh, you know, let's go to airlines again. Things are going to have to change dramatically in the airline industry if we're going to be able to, to run sustainable businesses, you know, come in, into, the, into the 21st century. And, and the, the big issue, of course, is just to get more efficient aircraft. Uh, and, uh, you know, aircraft's efficiency hasn't changed dramatically in, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, they've got bigger, they've probably got safer, they've got more advanced, but, you know, the, uh, the uh, entertainment system's a lot better, but they still use vast amounts of increasingly expensive fuel. So Virgin decided a few years ago that, that it could do something which but would perhaps really focus the minds of the Boeings and the Airbuses of this world to really think about how they might use modern materials, technology, modern aviation, aerospace design to build better aircraft that, that Virgin Atlantic, Virgin America and others could use in order to run better businesses, better for the customers, better for the, the business and better for the planet as well. And so we, we, uh, we had this plane built. It was called the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer. Uh, it was built by a company in uh, Mojave in California that you're going to be hearing a lot more about in the next few minutes called Scaled Composites, which was led uh, by one of the world's foremost um, aerospace aviation design gurus, uh, Bert Rutan. Now, um, we built it uh, for a guy called Steve Fawcett, a good friend of Richard's, uh, who's sadly no longer with us, who I think had the world record for having more world records than anybody else. Uh, and one of the world records that he wanted to have to hold that he hadn't achieved at that point was to fly an aircraft right around the world on a single tank of fuel without stopping. And we thought this was a great opportunity, you know, to, to bring adventure into the brand or to, to, to really strengthen that, that value of adventure. Uh, obviously, strong links to aviation but also to prove to, uh, to the world at large, but also to those that are in positions of power in the design and the, uh, the build of commercial aircraft, that it could be done better. Uh, so um, this aircraft was built out of 100% carbon composite. It was only built for, for one, one pilot. Um, and in 2005, it, it did what had never done, been done before. And Steve Fawcett successfully circumnavigated the globe. Um, just one person on board, no stops, single tank of fuel. And, uh, and of course, you know, these lessons do get learned. And we're now seeing aircraft like the Dreamliner, the A350, that are starting to use some of the lessons that we learned from this aircraft and from others in the use of carbon composite materials uh, in large aircraft design and manufacture, which are dramatically starting to bring down fuel consumption. And uh, that's going to be incredibly necessary uh, as we move forward into the next decade. So what does this all have to do with space? Well, when we as a business look at all the huge challenges that we, you know, we face as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a global population, it becomes really clear, I think, that there's no silver bullet. There's no one button that you can press which is going to solve everything. But we've also been aware, you know, for the last 20 years, you know, that space really matters. And uh, if there was another button that you could turn off space today, you know, life would change very dramatically in the way that we communicate, the way that we navigate, the way that we uh, harvest foods, the way that we send goods around the world. We are incredibly dependent on space uh, for, for many of the activ activities and the uh, requirements that uh, go alongside managing the, uh, you know, the needs of a burgeoning global population. So we had always identified space as a potential area of, of business. It looked like a good commercial opportunity. I think alongside that, you know, I know that, that Richard and probably many others in this room, you know, have been incredibly inspired by space, particularly during the 1960s. You know, that was one of, I guess, one of the most remarkable decades as far as the advancement of technology is concerned uh, that we have ever seen. You know, at the beginning of the 60s, we had hardly put anything into space. By the end of the 60s, two men were walking on the moon. Uh, and it was uh, just such an inspiring 10 years for those that were living through it. And uh, you saw those incredible pictures of people uh, outside the world that we knew. Uh, they looked like they were having fun. It was certainly a very different world. You know, no gravity, amazing views, all those sort of things. And a lot of people thought, I'd like to do that. And uh, those that were young at the time, their parents, I think, were saying, you know, this is going to be possible. We've seen the pace of change. You know, this is going to continue. By 1985, you know, it's probable that most people are going to be holidaying on the moon or at least, you know, having a trip to space for a weekend or whatever it is. 
And you know, for that generation, it was really, I think, very dispiriting and disappointing that as the, uh, uh, the space industry grew, it, be, it, became, it became even sort of increasingly exclusive. Fewer and fewer people were getting into space. They all had to belong to certain, or citizens of certain countries. Uh, they had to be super fit. They had to be super intelligent. They had to be government employees. And really, I think the, 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 the chance of you and me getting to space, you know, certainly as we, we approached the end of the uh, 20th century, was looking incredibly remote. And that's, I guess, you know, a, a cue for the, for the classic virgin business in some ways, because I said earlier, we love, a, we love a challenge. We love looking at businesses where we think we can do things better, where the public are being badly served. And Richard and others, I think, I thought, I think if they, they wanted to go to space, then probably lots of other people do as well. And we tr ought to try and do something about it. So um, back in the, uh, the 90s, Richard actually uh, registered the, the, the name Virgin Galactic and sent a team of people uh, from Virgin out to do what we'd done in the airline industry, really, which was to go and get our hands on a vehicle, uh, put the Virgin logo on it, and start sending people to space. Uh, and we very quickly found out that uh, sending people to space was not like uh, taking people from London to New York in a 747. And the, the reason for that, as many of you will know, is that there has been just an incredible lack of advancement in space launch technology, you know, since the 1960s. Um, I'm really mixing my uh, superpower metaphors here. Uh, so, but we, we do have a problem. In 19, this, these are two of my favorite photos. 1961, that's the photo of Yuri Gagarin that, um, going into, uh, just launching himself into orbit, or being launched into orbit. Uh, and the picture on the right uh, is a very recent Soyuz launch. Um, and it is just ex extraordinary when you think how just about everything else in the field of technology has just been transformed in that period, that it's actually pretty